there was always one or two show albums in the house. Love Gods and Dolls and, and uh, Kiss Me Kate were, I think, were his absolute favorites. My parents talked a lot about what South Pacific had meant to them as survivors of the war experience, how much Oklahoma meant to them. But they were, they were just normal, lower middle class people who went to the theater because it was something better than film. It was not another Joan Crawford movie at the Neighborhood Theater. It was, you know, just finer. They loved Death of a Salesman. They loved, but those are the shows they saw. Death of, they saw the big hits, the mainstream. They weren't off searching out for new, interesting countercultural playwrights. So, but I was also aware of theater was special. And then suddenly, it seems to me, there are playwrights, American playwrights, springing up everywhere. And Edward Albee and his two producers, Dick Barr and Clinton Wilder, uh, started this uh, group called Playwrights Unit. And they started giving young playwrights a theater and a small budget to do their plays. It was like one week of rehearsal, very brief, and then like four performances on two on Saturday, two on Sunday, usually at the Cherry Lighting. But they also rented the Van Damme Theater sometimes, which is where Boys in the Band was first seen. So I think to me, I, they were doing it about the same time as Cafe Chino and Ellen Stewart, La Mama. Uh, both seemed to happen within two or three year period. But suddenly American playwrights were, were sexy. I remember Sam Shepard was on the cover of Time and Newsweek, both within a month of each other. Uh, and I just can't imagine that happening today, really. Mm -hmm. It seemed that the main, main focus of New York City seemed to be off-Broadway and the new writers. It was Incredibly welcoming. You know, I don't know who invented off-Broadway. Uh, you know me, I was doing plays in Provincetown, which is a five-minute walk from here. I think they thought they invented off-Broadway. When I got to New York, two of the biggest hits in town were uh, Iceman Cometh with Jason Robards, which was uh, the beginning of the O'Neill revival. His career and the director, Jose Quintero, and Ted Mann <coughs> as an artistic director of something called Circle in the Square, which became a very important off-Broadway theater. But that was a big hit. And then just a few blocks away on Christopher Street, that was at Sheridan Square, that just the other side of Sheridan Square on Christopher Street at the Theater de Lise was La Lenya in the Three Penny Opera. Barbara Cook was in it, B. Arthur. That was a huge hit, too. So. Off-Broadway did not begin for my generation with La Mama or Chino or any of those. It was already sort of in place. And people made a big thing of coming to the village to see a play. It was sort of, the village was romantic. Christopher Street was a very romantic street in those days. And I remember there was a chocolate shop across the street, Lilac Chocolates. These people, clearly not from the neighborhood, would buy chocolates. Opening. They were being, I probably had, you know, one of those Italian restaurants with the candle and the wine bottle and the dribbling wax. And now Christopher Street is probably the least romantic block in New York, and that theater is still very successful. Walt Valor Compassion. Again, Manhattan Theater Club. This time I had been going to Circle Rep, and they not only had a playwrights, lab where on Friday they'd read a new script. They also had a director's lab mm -hmm. where young directors would do scenes. And I'd seen four or five by this actor, Joe Mantello, and I thought they were always wonderfully directed. So when I said to Lynn, I'd like Joe Mantello directed, she said, who's he? I said, he's an actor. Well, what's he directed? Well, he's done workshops, but he's never directed a commercial production as far as I know. Oh no, we can't have that. You know? So we sent the script to three or four Tony Award winning directors and they all came in with their vision of the play. And Joe's vision of the play was what I envisioned, so very simple. And I said, no, I want, I want uh, Joe Mantello. And I guess by then I had a certain amount of 
weight I could pull. I, I mean, I did a club after so many plays, most of them successful, uh, that they sort of had to, okay, if you mean it. And uh, Joe did a spectacular job. Yeah. He has been more than generous in acknowledging the role I played in his career. As I hope I've been generous acknowledging people like Elaine May, the role they played in my career. And I said, you know, Lynn Meadow, a women, the, the notorious producer Adele Holzer, who ended up in jail twice for <laughs> scam. She produced uh, The Ritz on Broadway, and she transferred bad habits from the Astro Place Theater to the booth. So I've worked a lot with women producers. Corpus Christi, 1980, uh, I'm sorry, 98. 98? Yeah, 98. Uh, well, Corpus Christi, the story there is um, I wanted to write a play uh, about gay men having gay men. I was not uh, generous enough to include gay women at that point in my life. I, guess, I wasn't interested in their saga. I was interested in the men's side of it. Uh, and remind me to mention something about that later. But I just wanted to write a play about that, and I just I thought about well, Christ and the Twelve Apostles, all unmarried men. I like, it just just fell into place. Uh, I never thought there'd be any controversy about the play, and I don't think anyone did. So we were rehearsing away, and, and, and by then we didn't have trouble casting it. We didn't have famous people in it, but no one turned it down because it was too gay or bad for their career. And we were rehearsing, and then one day some came and said, have you seen the post today? And there was a gossip column by this guy called Ward Morehouse the second or third. And he said, there's this obscene play <laughs> in rehearsal in that theater club which has Jesus and the disciples, lots of nudity, on stage, filet show, and anal intercourse. And then I just created this tempest, none of which was true. There was no nudity in the play. There was one chaste kiss when Judas betrays Christ, uh, but just made up a story. So suddenly, the phones are ringing, death threats, and that theater club is canceling the play. It was just... So by the time they, the Manhattan theater club came to their senses, because they were so denounced by the artistic community for lack of backbone, um, the only people allowed to see the play were subscribers. You had to go through metal detectors to get into the theater. Most of my friends, I could not get into the theater. They would have only let subscribers because how did they know that a stranger coming up to the box office was not a potential assassin or terrorist? That was their excuse. I, I did get some friends in. I did. I'm bringing blah, blah, blah. But they, you could not go to the box office. So we played, they had a lot of subscribers, so it was never empty, but there were always empty seats to a play that you couldn't, everyone wanted to see. Uh, I was totally unprepared for this, but as I said, it was based on, then they called the Archbishop of New York for a comment. Well, what do they expect to say? A play that has on stage nudity, Christ and uh, uh, apostles doing fellatio and anal intercourse, what are they going to say? We welcome. This new look at the New Testament? No, they were up in arms. So then that son of a bitch, Ward Morehouse, when the play finally opened, said, because of the heavy pressure on him, McNally has removed all the offending passages. Oh. There's no more nudity, no more. So I had an early taste of the Trump era, fake news, long before it happened to an entire nation. The Rink was the first musical that I opened with my name on it. And The Rink is an interesting story. Uh, phone rings and this is John Cantor. Hi, on the other line, this is Fred Ebb. So I knew who they were. And they said, uh, we have this show we like. We think we've written some really good songs for. It. And we're very unhappy with the book. 
And I said, yeah, what we'd like to do is you come up here and let us play the 10 songs we have for you and see if they suggest some sort of plot to your story. She said, okay. So I got the subway, went up, heard the songs, and I'd say all but maybe one or two were in the show as it opened. But when you hear a song like The Rink, here we go around The Rink, clearly it takes place in a rolling skate, skating rink. Clearly the emphasis of the story is mother, daughter, generational conflict. But I came up with a plot pretty quickly that they liked. And when I said to myself, I think the best musicals get written together, not connect the dots. So I said, never again will I work on a musical that the score pre-exists the book. It should happen together, or the book should be mother, father to the parent of the uh, lyrics and music. But I still enjoyed the experience. And uh, Cheetah, you know, the legendary Cheetah, I mean, my God, Maria, and those head stories, so I'm like, I can't believe this. And at the very last minute, somehow, suddenly, Liza Minnelli was in it. And I was like, I can't believe this. And, um, oh God, um, J.D. Antoon, of one of the very first, I was going to have a brilliant career in the theater, first AIDS uh, victim I knew, personally, but none of us knew he was sick. He would just disappear a lot. Where's AJ? Uh, he'll be back in an hour. And then suddenly he just was gone. It was, it was really early. I don't even know the word. They were, weren't even calling it AIDS. It was the gay cancer. Mm -hmm. and that long name they had originally. Uh, but that um, that was the beginning. The, the total AIDS took on the theater community was staggering and AJ was I think maybe the first person of great note to to succumb to it. Uh, uh, but I learned a lot on that. I mean I, I always learned from shows. Cheetah it was like you learn there's no substitute for a great technique. Cheetah hits the bullseye eight shows a week. Lies is totally improvisatory it still hits the bullseye at the last second the arrow lands where she wants it to land. And I learned so much. I used to stand in the back of the theater and watch them, what I could learn as a writer. The discipline of the one and the generosity of the other. And I said, well, what am I saying to myself? Who are you saving it for? Liza gives it away every performance, or did, I mean, many years ago. But she was one of the most staggering movies abundantly, naturally gifted people I've ever had the pleasure of being in the same room with. And Cheetah was one of the most abundantly, and still is, just did the visit with her three years ago. The technique, it's just, but it's all technique. And it's, it doesn't mean it's not heartfelt. It's craftsmanship. Liza, it's not craftsmanship. It's, but she has that instinct to land on her feet. Theater is the balance between the tension between those two, be free, wild, go places you've never dared go, but know you're not going to end up on your feet. You owe that to yourself and the audience and your collaborators. And, that's, and I think of both those women, how much they taught me working on that strange show, which I liked uh, the book. We, I got hammered for it a lot. But having Liza, who was at Studio 54 every night playing an anti-war activist, was probably not the best casting in the world. <laughs> she had speeches you know, about the war in Vietnam and things like that. I don't think that was too convincing to an older audience and <laughs> critics were buying. But maybe, I don't know, it's being done, getting a big revival in London next year. So. Okay. We'll see. Then you went on to do the Kiss of the Spider Woman with Cheetah. Just Kiss of the Spider Woman. Yeah, Kiss of the Spider Woman. Kiss yeah. of the Spider Woman. Again, uh, they all begin the phone calls. This is Al Prince. I'm thinking, of, I want to make a musical with John and Fred, who are with me, in the office of Kiss of it. I, my mind, when I hope he's going to say, of the Spider Woman, because I thought it would make it 
didn't hesitate for a second what a great musical that would make. And he said, of the Spider Woman, I said, yeah, great. Let me reread it and look at the movie again. And uh, so I just thought, and most of my friends, what are you insane? That's a terrible idea. In fact, most of the musicals I've done, people thought were bad ideas, <laughs> like The Visit, and uh, certainly people thought a ragtime was a terrible mm -hmm. idea for a musical. Um, but I thought, yeah, I would have thought Pygmalion was a terrible idea for a musical, <laughs> so I would have said no to, to that offer. So everybody hears music at different things, places and voices. So, um, but musicals, I they humble me, and I after Anastasia, I put my sign back up. No more musicals. Um, they're, they're humbling. They're just. I don't think anyone really knows how to do them, and it's kind of luck. And they all come together, or they don't, and usually they don't. And there's so many bright people working on musicals, but just so many people involved with every decision. And a play, you know, I can say, if you see a play of mine, I wrote it. When you see a musical, my name is on it, and I wrote every line of dialogue. But I didn't do that dance, I didn't write that song, I didn't do that bit of orchestration. And maybe that's not the orchestration I thought was right for that moment. So it's hard to say you're getting, you're trying to make it look like one person. But to get six or seven people singing in one voice is hard. And on My Fair Lady, it worked. It, it sounded like one person put it all together, including George Bernard Shaw. and. Uh, does it proud? It does Werner and O proud. It does Mozart proud. It does everybody proud. Uh, but they are probably the defining American art form, and I see why people are drawn to them. Um, and then, you know, every show that I've sort of been, see, no one has ever asked me to write a play, but I've been asked to write musicals. The ones I've said yes to, there's always been story involved, and like Spider Woman. There's a chance to work with Hal Prince, the, the legend, my God. Uh, Anastasia was commissioned by a Russian producer. We were going to have the world premiere in Moscow. And I thought, how thrilling to live in Russia, the land of Chekhov and Stanislavski for half a year, and create a new American musical there. And we did it, and suddenly Broadway producers said, this show is, they sort of said, this show is too good for Moscow. We're going to try it out here first. So now it's going to go to Moscow like in two years from now. And everyone I've spoken to said, you dodged a very big bullet not working in Moscow on a new American musical. That Technologically, they are several years behind us. And they don't know transitions. You know, it's like curtain falls, hammering from backstage for <laughs> two minutes, the curtain goes up on a new set. You know, things that we just don't do anymore. And, uh, and then the climate in Russia, I think, has changed quite a bit, too. People have been there and said the overt anti-Semitism and homophobia is shocking to an American. Yes. Shocking. So maybe it would have been a miserable six months there. But that's why I originally what drew me to, you know, I still love to travel. You uh, talk a little bit about ragtime. Ragtime, someone calls, I have the rights to ragtime. Yes, I'm sure I want to do it. Let me reread the book, which that's a book you can read in one night, really. And I thought the only problem with ragtime is how to keep it from being 30 hours long, because every scene, every line that book sings to me. Mm -hmm. You can write a scene here, a song there. So it's just whittling it down and giving it theater shape as opposed to. And I deliberately did not see the movie, which I knew was not well received. And I remember Dr. O on talk shows bewailing uh, the movie of his book, that he ruined it, blah, blah. So I said, I'm never going to watch this movie. So I wrote a treatment of it about, I think it's almost 60 pages long, which was, this is how I see it. He began to, 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 you know, to the end. And we gave it to Dr. O and he approved it. And I said, because I'm going to write the show 
you can come to Toronto for the first preview, but you know we're not co-writing the show. If you don't like it now, say, this is not the way I want the story told, fine, I will withdraw. No one had earned a penny or been paid a, you know, on spec. And he said, I, okay, okay. And he, kept, he came up to the preview. The drama, he had notes and thoughts, things he liked, things he didn't like. But he didn't write it. All right, so that's, so they said, who do you want to compose it now? I said, I said let's get a director. And the, and the uh, producer had just seen Grapes of Wrath. And everybody was like, where has Frank Galati been all our lives? And I said, what a perfect choice. He didn't have to meet it. So we offered it to Frank, and he read the treatment and said, yes. But again, who's the composer going to be? So I said, you know, I auditioned for this job. Yeah. Well, why don't we get composer and nurses to audition? What do you mean? Give them my treatment. Say, see if this inspires any music in you. Write a song or five, whatever you want, ideally three or four. Put them on a cassette, unmarked, and let us listen. The way I got the idea totally from the way the New York Philharmonic was starting to audition musicians behind the curtain. So you know if it's a young or old man or woman, ethnicity, you know nothing about this person except the way they play the violin. So we sent the script to, I think, the treatment to 11 all known, you've heard of everyone on the list, and five were insulted and said, go fuck yourself. I have three Tony Awards. And five, six, I think six, hey, there were six tapes arrived. One, two, three, four, five, six. We listened to the song separately. The producer here, Dr. Robert, Frank in Chicago, me here in this apartment. No, I was living on 22nd Street then. And I called, I said, I would only consider working with whoever wrote the songs for take three. Dr. Robert said, the only songs that remotely sound like that I could imagine being on take three. Frank Bellotti, because we now knew the names were you're going to listen to a score by Leonard Bernstein differently than a score by Mary mm -hmm. Jones. And I think it's a smart way to mm. find the right composer because you're not invested in their credits. And the few, I mean, I had a pretty unsuccessful musical, which again, I didn't take my name off it, but I did not. I parted company with it in Seattle, of Catch Me If You Can. It was put together by Together we have 85 Tony Awards. That doesn't mean we were the right six people to translate that material to the stage. So I think it's such a smart way to find, find people. So we could have been turning down Leonard Bernstein or George Gershwin and, and instead hiring Mary Brown, but Mary Brown wrote the best music and lyrics for this show. We opened it, you know, who wrote tape three? Lynn and Stephen, who I had seen, Lucky Stiff, which I know was talented, and Once, uh, Once on this Island, which I thought was amazing. I loved it. So I was thrilled it was them. And uh, it's in my archives in Austin, not to be open. The tapes are there, my copies and the names of the other people. But they're all, oh, you turned down. He could have written, she could have written. And that's a true story, and I think it's a very sensible way to do musicals. That's not how things are getting produced anymore. It's a package, you know. Whoever has the most Tonys gets the job. And it's not good producing. Um, the Full Monty. That, uh, I hadn't seen the movie, and Jack O'Brien called and said, look, this is really simple. You either want to do it or you don't. See the movie, but I can do it at my theater. So there's no problem about raising millions of dollars to do it at the Old Globe. I watched the movie and I said, Jack, the movie's not in English. I don't know what they're saying. I can't understand it. Can we get the screenplay? So I've watched it a few times with the script. I said, all right, I'll do it, but it's got to be in America and that's got to be a woman piano player, because otherwise, in the movie, they put on records, 
and rehearse to records. I said, that's not going to be fun. So I created the character, the old lady. And I wrote the show in, I swear, it felt like three weeks. I'm sure it wasn't. And uh, just came together and went open on Broadway. Less than a year later was 95% what they did. We did in uh, San Diego, which is one of those. <laughs> Cast never changed, just a happy show. Jerry Mitchell was a choreographer. The only change on it was David Yazbek, who was somebody I never worked with. Because there was no composer involved. And it, uh, Adam Gettle was going to compose it. And we sort of got nowhere after a month or so and said, I just not happening for me. He said, I have a friend. His name is David Yazbek, and here's his CD. And I, that's not my world, punk rock, where David does, did then this band, but the sounds and the lyrics were extraordinary. And I said, I don't care, he's never done a Broadway show. He's, he's the real deal. These are theater lyrics. And David wrote a brilliant score, I thought. Now, I'd say he considers himself a theater. He still does his band at Joe's Pub, but uh, that was just a great, happy choice. Uh, and that's, again, and people said, you know, Joe Mattel has never directed on Broadway. David Yazbek's never written a Broadway show. Well, you, someone has to give you your first chance, mm -hmm. or we'd all be dead. I'd be the only living American playwright. Uh, and I've got enough people nipping at my ass as it is. <laughs> I've been nipped. Uh, so you need, you know, producers with some courage and imagination. And theater is always a leap of faith. I mean, I don't care if it's. Marlon Brando, he could give a bad performance, maybe, uh, you know, no guarantee. Because he's Marlon Brando, he's going to be Stanley Kowalski again, or The Godfather. So I think producers have gotten more timid than they used to be. And I know a lot of it is because of the enormous expense. But there's still fearless people out there. I mean, you know, in the past two years, both The Humans and Doll's House Part Two were by relatively young, unknown playwrights, open cold on Broadway, without, quote, stars. They're very successful, so it still happens just harder. It's, it's a real news story, whereas when I started, there were five or six new American plays by unknown writers without stars on Broadway a year. Which said, you know, people like Eileen Hegart was not a star. She was known, but not it's not the Ben Midler and Hello Dolly, which is, at the moment, that seems to be what our theater is most enraptured of, Bruce Springsteen's solo, Ben and Hello Dolly. And that's, that's a dead end, you know. So we need producers who are going to have vision, look to the future, like the people were in what we're meant to be talking about off Broadway. So it really, it really hasn't changed what we're talking about. Who's going to bring in the new people? And I mean, one of the unsung heroes of the American theater to me is Robert Redford. He was on Broadway, I think, once in his life, maybe twice. We, you know, his Sundance Institute, they bring about eight to 10 playwrights out there every year. That's where Frankie and Johnny began. Kathy Bates and I, and I developed a relationship there. Uh, he never gets credit for running this place. People hear about the Sundance Film Institute. But he's developed a lot of good theater at that place. And Edward Albee, you know, was breaking in some big bucks with Virginia Woolf in those shows, and he put it back into helping the next generation of writers. And not, not many successful playwrights have done that. And uh, I, I do believe in giving back, and I wish more people did. I'll say it that bluntly. Because you got to help the next generation, or welcome them to the theater, not get away, you know. Sometimes you do feel there's not much room on the life raft, I mean, the lifeboat, get away, get away. But, you, you know, we got to, it'll hold us. we got to let them, the new, new people on. I'm also aware at 79, uh, how many plays I've left, what I want to write about. You know, I, there was a long period of a master class was my last play because it felt very autumnal and valedictory to me. And I'm so glad I didn't stop. 
I've written four or five, but I don't have any place since. But I felt I sort of said what I want to say. And um, so right now, two, two plays percolating, I'm very excited about. But the percolation is not fingers on keyboard. We'll see. But I still have my enthusiasm for theater. Um, it's the stamina part that is, it, it, it's hard work theater. And when you're young, you just have more stamina. You know? and six flights of stairs or nothing. Eight shows a week or nothing, you know. And the only actors I know who don't get tired of doing eight shows a week are Cheetah and Nathan. And you know, they're older than most of their co-stars who are always go backstage at these shows and oh, God, three <laughs> shows. And there's Cheetah like, let's do the fifth show, you know. <laughs> I'm ready to go on. I like I, I like Energizer Bunnies to write for. I've got a little of that left in me, I guess. Where do you see Off-Broadway going and Off-Off-Broadway? Uh, Off-Off-Broadway is in Brooklyn now. I mean, this young man who is sitting here who's uh, my assistant, they find spaces. Their biggest problem, he said, is uh, the amount of rent. Even to use a, a room suitable for inviting an audience and you know, performing a play for un well under 100 people. Some people will last $2,000 just for two days and they don't. So they find a place that's maybe two or $300 and they chip in. And they're... But there are as many young playwrights out there as there were when I started, but Manhattan is it's not where they're happening. They're, they're going to Brooklyn and I'm sure the Bronx and Queens, uh, Staten Island, but I have not heard about new work being done on Staten Island yet. Uh, I, I just think people like to get together and there's enough people who like to act and there's enough people who like to tell stories through dialogue and I don't want to describe what, you, what you're wearing. And they want to see how you move, behave, speak. And uh, I, I just was a bad, I think most playwrights don't write good descriptions of the room or, we don't, you know, in theater you don't get to write, he, he was thinking, da, 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 da. you got to write a scene where the actor is forced to think about his dead mother, even though he's ordering a cow to the fish. So it's such a different, and I think you're attracted to what you, brings out your strong suit, and even when I was a journalist, I liked interviews more than straight news stories, trying to capture what people sounded like. I remember uh, early in my, in the summers I worked at a professional newspaper in Corpus Christi, and not a bad paper, called the Corpus Christi Color Times, and they asked me to interview Lyndon Johnson, who was a senator then. And while I was interviewing him about the oil depletion tax of which I knew nothing and cared even less. <laughs> the phone rang and they said, it's Mrs. Johnson. So he's talking, yeah, in just a minute, I'm sitting where you are, gets on the phone, yeah, bird. And he starts flipping through the, this month's Playboy. Yeah, bird, yeah, uh-huh. He looks at Miss January. Yeah, well, tell Lucy she can't. Or, you know, he has a real mom and pop call. Okay, so you're saying, young man, about the old senator. So in the interview I mentioned during the phone call, Mrs. Johnson called during which the senator uh, was flipping through this month's Playboy and the editor didn't say anything. We ran the story and he got a call from Senator Johnson's office. Oh, who was that young? You sent this child to interview the senator and did this to him. And, and I thought it just made the story interesting to me. <laughs> like millions of men, he was looking at, talking to his wife and looking at, Playboy, and I thought that was much more interesting than the old depletion tax. So I think I was destined to be a. And also, playwrights were in such control of what people say. You know, writers are probably the most controlling people in the world. The script of Hamlet is what William Shakespeare wrote. Not, you can't rewrite it. You know, you can try to get an actor to perform it a certain way, but Hamlet's going to die every performance. Uh, he doesn't get, get out of that one. So, 